Welcome to the I Now Pronounce You Divorced podcast, where we have three award-winning family law attorneys dive into intriguing topics like divorce, military divorce, custody and visitation, trust and estate planning, and all things family law. Join us as we provide a comprehensive viewpoint through the eyes of our experts and guests aiming to educate and soothe our listeners. Get ready to tune in because I Now Pronounce You Divorced starts right now. Yeah, uh, preparedness is the key, right? The five Ps. Proper preparedness prevents poor <laughs> performance. <laughs> That's a tongue twister. I didn't think about that in my head while you were talking. But it, it, it rings so true. And not only do you want to mm-hmm. interview that expert, but how I've handled cases is I let the, I say, you're the expert. Tell me the questions you want me to ask because I need to educate myself and be able to uh, present your case or my case in the proper way. So I want the expert to do a lot of the heavy lifting in the beginning, but then we'll start poking mm-hmm. holes in their case. And I'll have another one of my colleagues come in and do cross-examination and we'll find other competing or conflicting opinions and ask the expert. So what is your response to this and how does it apply to to my case? And then you can identify it. Not only do you believe that this person is credible, but will a judge and or a jury believe that? And then are you at the end of the day, sabotaging your own case just because you want to get an expert involved. So I, I think Rebecca's spot on. You don't want to cheap out on it. You want to make sure that you're you're hiring the best person for your case and your jurisdiction. Absolutely. I mean, the Johnny Depp and Amber Heard case could give us so much fodder to talk about for days is because it was so well publicized. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I, I looked at that expert and I was like, you know, he's a terribly intelligent person, right? You know, as smart as you could ever want. And I was like, this you know, poor expert was kind of set up to fail from the beginning because what I saw was a lack of preparation. You know, the, everything, it's five Ps, you know, a lack of preparation. And, you know, when he was saying, this is not what I thought it was, that means he wasn't prepared by the, the person who paid for him, right? They, they paid money for him to be there, but then didn't take the time to prepare him. So that was not, you know, money well spent. There was no ROI on that particular witness that day. Um, you know, the next thing I kind of, you know, we get to the experts and, and experts are a wonderful way to get around some of the, uh, the issues with what kind of evidence you're allowed to present. Right. So an expert's allowed to take and read things and then give an expert opinion on them. What type of other evidence do y'all find is very helpful in these types of cases of parental alienation? Well, in, in almost every case, whether you have an expert or not, you're going to have a guardian ad litem appointed. And that can be the greatest thing for your case, or it can, you know, really just bring it down. But the guardian ad litem, one of the benefits of having them appointed is they can look at almost everything. So they can go to the school and talk to the teachers and the counselors and the therapists and the family members and, you know, everybody in the world who you you may not necessarily subpoena to court, um, but they can really do a lot of investigation and a lot of, of background um, mm-hmm. before they ultimately give an opinion or position on, on what should happen moving forward with custody and visitation. And so they're able to, based on all of that information, give a recommendation. And so you might have some evidence that's not necessarily directly admissible. They can still provide it indirectly to the court in their recommendation as a basis for their recommendation. Um, that comes up a lot with like the child's opinion. So depending on how old the child is and the reason for, you know, their position or their opinion or their preference, um, they're going to be communicating directly to the GAL and say, you know, this is what I want and the reasons for it. And then that's something that the GAL can turn around and communicate to the court. Um, And you don't necessarily have to bring the child in as a witness, which is obviously something we always want to avoid. So that's definitely beneficial. Um, or, or it can be really harmful. That's, that's the thing with GALs is they're really, they have access to everything and you don't always know how the recommendation is going to play out based on all these conversations and all of this, this investigation they've done. Yeah. The, the guardian litem is supposed to be an independent, uh, person, right? Uh, but they're an arm of the court and judges rely heavily on uh, a guardian ad litem or GAL's opinion. They don't necessarily quote rubber stamp them, but it's hard to get them off of what a guardian ad litem would recommend. But Rebecca, when you were touching on uh, the authority that the guardian ad litems have, it reminded me of uh, a good way to actually impeach a guardian ad litem. If you have one that 
doesn't give a, a, a good recommendation in your favor. And everything you said is exactly what I would suggest to make sure that the guardian lighting was doing as far as their due diligence and how you can impeach them. If they're not interviewing certain witnesses, why not? Who did you interview? Why did you interview them? What subpoenas did you send out? Why did you send out those subpoenas? And it, and it's, you know, we try not to try and impeach a guardian the line because the, the child is their client. So we, we take that under advisement, but we also want to make sure that our client is given a, a fair representation, a fair opportunity to be able to present his or her case. But when, when you have a guardian item involved, it is so important from the beginning to be as proactive as possible, meaning you want your client to reach out to the guardian item to, to initiate that first contact. You want to prepare your client for that because you don't want your client going in blind to any of these meetings. And it's not preparing so you can trick the guardian line. It's just making sure that your client feels safe and comfortable in answering questions, but being completely transparent and honest and not berating or uh, insulting the other parent. That does not go well, and it goes the other way. People think uh, that they can go in and just unload and say, oh, my spouse is such a horrible person because of X, Y, and Z. Well, that's going to backfire. You really want to go in and try to say at least something complimentary, right? Like they're a good parent or they mean well or something, right? And that's what you want to flush out with your attorney. And, and that, of course, with the caveat, it's based on the issues and the allegations in the case. So we, that's why everything is so fact specific. But one of the unique things in some of the jurisdictions that I practice in is you, uh, the court can appoint a guardian line, of course, on its own to a sponte, dependent upon the allegations, right? That would um, rise to level what the statutory requirements are, or you can file the motion for a guardian ad litem, and then the court appoints the, the GAL. But the unique thing is we, as the, the practitioner, the attorney can determine, do we want to keep that person or not? And you have 15 days from the date of the appointment to file the motion to disqualify. Them. And it's like that they're, they're out. So it, it's a good advantage. It's kind of like a, a motion to, to strike or striking a, a juror but you only get one. So you want to make sure that uh, you're, you're using it wisely. Just like in, in uh, two of the three jurisdictions that I practice in, you can file a motion for a change of judge. So once a judge is appointed, because you have no idea who's going to be appointed to your case. We don't have certain judges that handle certain cases or there's just some way of, of assigning them. It's just uh, really random. But once you know who that judge is, if you don't think he or she is a good fit to the case, in these two states that I'm licensed in, Missouri and, and Illinois, you can file a motion to change. And it's granted just like that. You have 30 days from the date of the appointment to file a motation for change. Wow. So there's some it's strategic uh, tactical advantages, depending upon where you're at and going to what you were saying earlier, Charles, that you want to make sure that you have that right attorney involved in the case from the beginning so they know mm -hmm. who, who do we want to be on the bench or do we need to get a guardian ad litem? And if so, who do we really want to stay away from? Because the thing is that a lot of attorneys I, I see get caught up on is sure, you don't like this one person, so let's disqualify them, but who's going to come in right after, right? So you got to weigh your options to determine. Yeah, I mean, and that goes to, I mean, your attorney is supposed to be helping you strategize, not just, uh, you know, we, we do have whims where we don't like somebody. And, and you know, guardian items tend to be wonderful people who really care about children. But man, they, they're the target of some hate that I would not want to be the target of because they truly do represent the children. And that means mm -hmm. they do not represent the desire of the parent. And, you know, when I practiced, when a guardian ad litem was appointed in one of my cases, you know, I would go to the hearing or however the guardian ad litem was appointed. As soon as I found out, I reached out to that guardian ad litem. I provided them with my version of an authorization to speak to my client because, right, I represent the client. They're an attorney. They still need authorization to speak to the client. And the first thing I said was, let me know what you need. Let me be a, a help to you. Because, you know, I think that it's important to understand they're doing a lot of heavy lifting. Like you both said, I mean, the court, it doesn't necessarily rubber stamp their opinion, but the judges are judging them on how well they go out and interview people and go to the school. And if I can help them do their job better, mm -hmm. then it is probably going to be good for my client. And, you know, like you said, prepare your client for that meeting but at the same time, I know some some practitioners want to go sit at the meeting, you know, right? They want to go sit there at that meeting. And, you know, I've had I've heard horror stories about practitioners that will not provide the authorization to speak with the client without them there. No, go do it. Go do your job, guardian litem. 
And what that does is, you know, it puts the guardian items guard down. And, and I will tell you, the worst thing that I've seen a, a practitioner do is start talking bad about the guardian litem to the client because now you poison the well, right? Now the client's going to react poorly to the guardian litem. And even though the guardian litem may be the best guardian litem to ever walk into that court, your client's going to treat them with a chip on their shoulder and, and you're going to lose the case just because you happen to say, oh man, I had that guardian litem before and they went against me and I don't understand it. No, they, they've got tough jobs too, right? <laughs> Oh yeah, I, I, you're spot on. Be open and honest, and and be transparent, because otherwise it gives the appearance of some type of impropriety. Whether or not anything is going on, if you're going to be combative mm -hmm. or non-cooperative, you're, you're setting the tone, and, and and that's a bad tone to set. It, it absolutely is, and, and you know, going beyond the guardian litem, we recently, not recently, it's not recent. We we had a case in Northern Virginia where the father was being alleged to have abused the child. And so the father, when he was around the child, just just video recorded the interaction and, you know, that and then brought the video recording into court, which would normally be hearsay. Right. He was recording the child's responses to do I abuse you? And I, this is an oversimplistic you know, thing. So it may have been different words. But the, the idea was that dad was asking if, if the child thought he abused him, dad, if the child was afraid to be at dad's house. The child answered unequivocally no. And the, the court in Fairfax County actually allowed that evidence in without the child being there for subject to cross-examination. So, you know, what would be clearly pretty clear hearsay. Is there anything that you all have seen kind of in that line where the court lets in more novel uh, evidence to help it get an answer? I've definitely seen some some recordings, videos, you know, things like that that have been allowed in. And And the trick is you're not trying to admit it for the truth of the statement. You're trying to admit it either to challenge someone else's statement. So if mom got on the stand and said, daughter's terrified of dad, now mm -hmm. you're using that piece of footage to contradict or impeach mom's statement. Um, and so you can get a lot of stuff into court either through impeachment or through another method. You're trying to show you know, the present sense impression you're trying to show show some other aspect of, of what's going on more than just the fact that the child is saying no. You're showing that the child is jumping around and playing and, you know, like wrestling with the dad or, you know what I mean? Just very playful, very happy, um, you know, very clearly not staged. And then it, it contradicts everything that mom is saying about how the child acts with dad. Um, and so we, we are able to get some evidence in that way. And basically what you do is try to elicit that response first from mom, because you know, you have, you know, this evidence that's going to contradict it. Okay. So you would say your child is terrified of dad and you would say, you know, your child doesn't want to go with dad or doesn't play with dad or doesn't whatever. Now I can bring that in, in an impeachment situation. That's one of my favorite ways to bring in evidence um, that otherwise you obviously can't get in front of the judge, can't get in front of the courtroom. But now the judge has seen with their own eyes, the child smiling and happy and playing, and you can't take that image back out of their head, right? Once it's there, it's there. Um, so that that's definitely one of my favorite methods. Yeah, you know, and just to add to that, because I echo everything you just said for the the benefit of maybe evidence being entered that you, you would have objected to. But look in the background, too. So many times I've won a case just because there was something in the background, whether it was alcohol, drugs, or even another individual, and no one pays attention. And so it's already entered in evidence, and you just go back to that and and then that may or may not help your case, depending upon what some of the issues are. So there, there are many avenues that are available when evidence is entered that you may or may not want to, uh, to be entered into. But then also, if it is entered into, you still have that parent leading the child on. And in and, and my experience, judges and guardian ad litems really have a very low, if zero, tolerance for when parents are leading children on and they're taking those pictures and those videos just for court related purposes. There's, there's more behind that. And then you have the, the other problem of there is that parental alienation. Well, you're helping prove that or uh, set that foundation. And so you can use that evidence for to uh, assist you in your case. Yeah. Evidence is tough. I mean, I remember I had a client and he had a 16 or 17 year old daughter and he had been fighting for custody for five, six, seven years. And nobody believed him. He had went through a lot of attorneys who were like, look, man, she's 16 years, 17 year old daughter, you know, give up. 
you know, you're not being alienated. The daughter said it to this very respectable therapist. The therapist is on the other parent's side. The other parent, the daughter seems to be there. And then through a rant, so I, I always believed the guy. He seemed very nice. And, and through a very random, inadvertent disclosure from the other side, they turned over years of emails between mom, the attorney, and the therapist on how to alienate dad. It was a game plan on how to alienate dad. And it's an inadvertent disclosure. So I had some ethical obligations for that inadvertent disclosure. And I called the bar. Unfortunately, the rules had not changed yet. But at that point in time, I first had an obligation to my client and turned it over to my client and gave him that information. And I honestly couldn't help myself. I uh, stapled the entire email communication chain to a motion and filed it with the court because I couldn't let that one go. And I know for an inadvertent disclosure, that may not always be what you're allowed to do. But the idea, like Rebecca said, is you can't put the ghost back in the box. The judge is never going to unsee that chain of emails. Um, there was some negative comments said about me by the judge for having done that because it's an inadvertent disclosure. What I should have done was turned everything back over to the other attorney and pretended like I had never seen it, I suppose. But I wasn't willing to do that. So it, when you're talking about, you know, to, to potential clients who are going through this, what should, you know, when, when I, I my, my takeaway there was always listen to your clients, right? Just believe your clients. There was no reason for me not to believe the clients. And, and a very experienced attorney said, you don't get to make the decision whether or not they're telling the truth. You don't get to pull the curtain back and see behind the scenes yet. They come to you and tell you this is happening. Just believe them. What is y'all's advice for, for what you should do when clients come to you with these sometimes very weird stories that may be a little bit not believable? So I think you, you start looking at, okay, well, how can we, how can we prove this? Um, you say that X, Y, and Z are happening. How, if we went into a courtroom right now, how could I prove that to a judge? And then we start putting the pieces together. Oh, well, you know, I guess there's some Facebook posts or there's some text messages or there's some this or there's some that, some photos or videos or, or whatever. And, and you can kind of put it all together in such a way to present that this is what's going on behind the scenes. And sometimes with parental alienation, it's really difficult to know what's happening behind closed doors, you know, what the other parent might be saying to the child and that type of thing. Um, but if you don't already have a paper trail, then starting to create that paper trail in a way that you're going to be able to present this to the court. So asking to, to pick the child up, asking for the phone calls, asking for the FaceTime videos or, or whatever. And then sometimes we see that like the FaceTime videos or the, or the phone calls are really being heavily monitored and controlled by the other parent. So sometimes getting a recording of that and showing the other parent is standing over the child's shoulder. Right. Or, or doing something like that. Right. And, and we can start to put together a timeline and show these are some of the instances where we can see something is going on. And then with the timeline, we know that around this time is when the child all of a sudden said, I hate you, dad, and I don't want to go with you anymore. Right. And so then we can kind of imply this must be what has been going on. This is this is demonstrating a pattern of what's been going on and the root cause for this problem. Um, so, so that's really number one though, when your client comes to you and says, the other parent is doing this. Okay, great. How can I show a judge that that's what's going on? And you really brainstorm together with them and start giving them some ideas and asking those questions so that you can start to put it all together. Yeah, I, I think it's it's challenging, right? Cause they come in and you have to make sure you're doing your due diligence to flush it out. But we also have that ethical obligation that if it comes up and we know our client is guilty of something, we have that obligation to advise the court because we can't put on a case where we know our client committed something, whatever that something is. But mm -hmm. you're, you're spot on. It all starts with the due diligence. And, and I like how you suggested to do that. I think that's a great practice tip for, for all attorneys when the client comes in. OK, so you're telling me X, Y and Z. So how can we get there and, and, and explain the process to the client? This is what we need to do. And here's how we'll have to sh uh, prove it. And we need to get some evidence and just kind of walk them through it so we can not only try to be able to move their case forward in a system, but it's also going to be judging their veracity and their credibility. And if you as the practitioner, the attorney are having some troubles with that, imagine what a judge or a jury or even a guardian litem is going to have. So you can start flushing out some of these issues 
in the beginning. And I'm not advocating that you withdraw or not take the case. It's just now, okay, if, if I have some questions or there's some holes, okay, maybe we try to settle this. And, and what does that look like? And have those discussions with the client. Because you, you don't always want to just litigate just for the sake of litigating or even if a client wants their day in court, right? I've had those clients where I, just, I don't care what happens. I want my day in court. Well, let's talk about that. But what does that mean to you? And sometimes that just means they want to be heard, not necessarily sitting on the uh, witness stand, but they just want to make sure that the attorney knows what their concerns are, are listening in and really zealously advocating for them. Yeah. And when you're trying to be a partner with somebody going through this process, you know, it, sometimes partners have to tell you things you don't want to hear. Right. They have to say, look, we can't take your case to court or look, I hear what you're saying. And, you know, we got to get some evidence from somewhere. We got to be able to take something into court. I want to thank both y'all today for, for showing up and talking about what I consider to be one of the more emotional topics that we talk about. Parental alienation is tough. And I want to thank both y'all because if, you know, if you're going through this, you need help. And that's my, that's my advice. If you're being alienated as a parent, get some help, man. Thank you for tuning into our podcast. If you found this episode helpful and you want more informational content, please be sure to subscribe and join us on all major social media platforms, including YouTube. Stay connected for more exciting updates and tips.